Good afternoon, excellencies, distinguished governors, ladies and gentlemen, very warm welcome. My name is Perrin saint -Ange. I am the Associate Vice President for Programs here in IFAD. IFAD, as you all know, is the only international financing institution in the United Nations and the only United Nations agency exclusively dedicated to investing in rural areas and focusing on smallholder agriculture. We are making a positive impact and it's a lasting impact with successful innovations having been scaled up through partnerships, reaching and benefiting through, throughout the world millions of rural smallholder farmers. Later this morning, we will hear from IFAD staff who will provide some examples of what they are doing on ground. We will be able to take questions and provide you with some clarifications on what we are doing in the field. Innovation is working and we are pleased to be promoting an increasing number of innovative features in our investment portfolio. But first, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Ismaham El Haufi, the Director General of the International Center of Biosaline Agriculture. She's based in Dubai. She is joining us today to talk about agriculture, innovations, smallholders, the challenges which they face on a day-to-day -day basis. Dr. El Haufi, a leading scientist, academic, geneticist, environmentalist. Tell us more. Thank you very much, Pera. It's really a pleasure to be today here at the Governing Council of Fed. What I want to address first is that we are at a time that is really bad. We got huge problems with securities at large. We got the social security problem, political security problem, combined with food security, nutrition security, and water security. So I think we have huge challenges, and we have to act right now. And that's what everybody has seen in December in Paris, but we have to talk about what are the next action, what we should implement. So to give you just a little bit of numbers, we have third population in the world that is malnourished. We have 1.2 billion people that live in areas that have huge water issues. We have every day, we are losing 2,000 hectares. For the last 20 years, we are losing 2,000 hectares for salinity. So we are at a point where a size of France as a country is affected by salinity right now. And things are going bad. You look at Central Asia, for example, 50% of their land, agricultural land, it's affected by salinity. So what I would like to use the time is to attract the attention of the governing council to the marginality issue. Marginal environments, unfortunately, didn't gain much from the Green Revolution. Green Revolution was great. We liked it all. It was a very high input agriculture that actually improved the livelihood of everybody, but on specific crops. And guess what? We left behind the marginal environments, and we left behind the poor people that live in marginal environments. So what I would like to argue today with the colleagues here is that we should focus on marginal environments if we talk about agriculture of tomorrow. Because agriculture of tomorrow won't be on arable land alone. We have big issues. And to face those big issues, we should gain and retain what we got from the Green Revolution, but start a new revolution in the marginal environment. If we add to all of this, the climate change impact, hey, that gets really bad. So if you look at the climate change, and luckily enough, it's not any more debatable that it exists. It's much more the magnitude that people are debating now. The last five years, 2011 to 2015, are the five hottest years since we start having a record on, on Earth, and we have record on the data. If you look at the data in Canada, 2014-15, winter was the coldest in 125 years. So climate change is a reality. And the impact of climate change, unfortunately, is going to impact again more the poor people, going to impact more those marginal environments, unless we act and we take action right now. And that's actually the only way we can get 
to the targets of SDG 1, zero hunger, and zero poverty. How are we acting on this? Acting, that's where you go really to the whole value chain. And I, I, I loved the talk of Dr. Mohammed Ibrahim. So you look at the whole value chain, and you see at the gaps where you have them. He brought up the gap yield in Africa, for example. He talks how Africa has the only few arable land that we haven't addressed, and it has a lot of land that could be also used under the marginality. So you need to invest from the beginning till the end. So we call it the upstream investment. If you invest in research and development, you get to return about $10. Every $1 you put in R&D, you get about $10 back. If I, I got some numbers about how much we are investing as, as a whole population in R&D and agriculture, the public sector invests about $31 billion, and the private sector only $18 billion. Whereas if you look at other, other, uh, other, uh, other sectors, you find that the private sector alone invests $647 billion in all sectors in 2013. Look at the number in 2013. And if you like, look at the, the biggest investment, you find them in automobile, for example, in IT. So why don't we invest in agriculture? Why can't we private sector look at the opportunities that are in agriculture and invest more in R&D? But R&D is not enough. You need to invest in R&D, you need to invest in infrastructure, you need to invest in the rural transformation. I always ask myself why we do agriculture in the rural area and then we do transformation <coughs> close to the city. It doesn't make sense if you think about it logically, if we're just like shuffling the whole thing and rethinking the whole. So it doesn't make sense. Why don't we bring more of the agribusiness in the rural area? Why don't we bring that education in the agriculture sector that many people were asking about in the, in the rural area? So if you look at the value chain, if you are an investor, you always find out that the more you go towards the market, the more you got the return on investment. So agriculture, it's the least return on investment. But why? Because we are putting them in a box. We are giving them only the option to produce. Why don't we provide them with facilities to do more? to do the processing, to do the marketing. And then if there are things that need to move to the urban area, I, I do understand that. But let's give them more. Let's try to move the value chain to be more in the rural setting than in the urban setting. We are doing a fair bit of this in IFAD. In fact, we invest about $1 billion a year to facilitate and, and help this process kick along. There are many challenges. And uh, you did mention at the very beginning, we cannot do the same agriculture today as we have been doing in the past. So what are some of the specific sort of returns from the investments in research that we can take up, we can facilitate the distribution, the sharing of this knowledge so that the uptake of new technology is expanded and the benefits to the farmers are scaled up? So I think this is a very good question and it's really, I think, Everybody is talking how much science can influence policy or how can science influence the reality on the ground. It's a really very complex issue, but I think there are many mistakes that we did over the years and that we have really to look at. The first one, it's doing the research in the wrong place. We tend to do Western research and then implement it somewhere else. Especially when you talk about agriculture. Agriculture, it's in nature. You can't bring me a crop that has been bred somewhere else and push it in the market and push it to the government and expect that I'm going to do well with it. So I think that R&D to be done at the place where it's going to be implemented is very important. Extension, more, many, many government, they just don't do any more extension. And how are you expecting university to provide advices, technical advice, so research to, to provide technical advices if there is no extension component. The other things that I see really myself lacking, it's really a communication, a flow, a use of innovation and IT technologies to provide the information to the farmer in the language that they could understand. So I think there are a series again as any complex issues where you have to desiccate it and you do action and intervention at different components or different portion of the problem to solve it. So in other words, the uh, inclusive nature 
of the for the uptake of new technology is very important. Absolutely. Involving involving the smallholders themselves Absolutely. to participate in on the one hand in the generation of technology which they are to benefit from, and on the other, getting them to participate in an ex inclusive manner Absolutely. in the design of programs and projects and investments the that will facilitate the, the other component that I think we have not done enough in it is the gender. So as Dr. Ibrahim said, the agriculture in Africa is done by women. The agriculture in the world is done by women. However, we are not really taking their know-how or we are not customizing the communication tools to them. So they have the problem of land tenure that he mentioned very rightly, but there is also the fact that most of the extension services, for example, we, I have a number here that only 5% of the extension services are designed for women, and only 15% of the extension workers are women. So we should pay attention to the gender, because what we find out through our work with IFAD, specifically in a project uh, named Adaptation to Climate Change, is that the women are much more receptive to technology. The women are much more receptive to change. They are very willing to change, and they make much more impact on the, on the livelihood of, of the family as well. So the gender component is very important to look at, and we should look into it more. We need to segregate data, we need to look at the issues specifically and target them. What we heard this morning and over the past uh, days or so is that, in fact, women bear the brunt of all the hard work but they are not the main ultimate beneficiaries you know, in terms of participation to finding solutions which will be of direct benefit to them. So there is a bit of disconnect in the sense that they do the hard work, but the delivery, the associated events, extension work, scientific training, education, does not involve in a substantive way women mm -hmm who are the net, or should be the net beneficiaries of all this investment. And I want to pick up on the education world, because I think that's another area where we need more investment. More of, most of the curriculum in most of the countries are at least 50 years old. Some of them are much more lower, much more 70 and 80 years. So if I take the example of Morocco, for example, we have a huge issue of education, because we have still the curriculum that was put in, in place when we got the, the independence time. So the education, I agree completely that we are not forming the people for the businesses. The normal way to do it is to really, really to do analysis on what you need. If we're an agriculture country, I need to form the people to work in agriculture at different levels, from the technical, to the professional, to the expert, to the scientist. So you have to have all of this. So education, it's a wonderful tool that we have for many, I don't know, for the last few decades at least, derailed a little bit from what we need from those people. Even when we talk tolerance, that's where you in, inserted in the people. You inserted the tolerance, you inserted the openness, you inserted the scientific ethics, for example, the ethical manners, all of them at the education. And the more you start very early, the better it is. So if we talk about agriculture, especially agriculture for tomorrow, the young people, they don't want to go do agriculture the same way that their parents were doing it. What they are looking for, it's a high-tech agriculture. High-tech doesn't need to be thousands of hectares the way Australia is doing it or Canada is doing it. It could be small greenhouses, it could be aquaponics where you have aquaculture and agriculture, something that pick their brain, something that ask from them to keep always looking at innovation, looking at the internet, looking what other people are doing. This way, we can make agriculture sexy, like what Dr. Ibrahim said. So what we are, and that's where what we meant sincerely by agriculture of tomorrow, it's how could we, if we are, if you look at the history of the world, we are at the third wave. We start agrarian, we move to the industrial world, and we are in the technology era. In the technology era, technology got everywhere. I'm always amazed how come we have mobile phone everywhere. Look at India. They have about a billion handsets. 
Look at Africa, everybody is connected to IT, but we haven't been using IT yet to influence agriculture. We haven't used IT to retain the young people to do innovative agriculture. That's where we may have to stop here, but in one word, what is your degree of optimism for the next 15 years? By the end of 2030, where will we be? I think we are at the best time to use innovation. I mean, if you look at our history, we have evoluted, uh, the evolution of humankind happened always because we were in a crisis. When you are in a crisis, you find the solution because you don't have other ways. We are at a time where technology is improving so quickly. It's becoming so affordable because there is a demand, because there is investment from private sectors mainly for it. So I'm very optimistic, specifically with the commitment of the world to the SDGs. I'm very, in, I'm very optimistic that it could happen. But it could happen only if we really look at the whole thing. The business model that we are using in the old days doesn't work. And that's an innovation, just changing your business model, changing the modest operation that you have to look for something where you can have impact much quicker and you can have also the impact much more higher. So that's what we are looking for. We are looking for, for ways to speed up the process. We don't want to wait for years and years. We want to get the, to that point much more quickly, but we keep in mind the sustainability, we keep in mind that it has to be done in partnership, and we keep in mind the inclusive development agenda. Dr. Lahafi, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I wish.